DigitalJamSessions.com. Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam Session. Today we are joined by the lovely Christina, we have Scott, we have the lovely Alessandra, and we have Muki and Amelia with us again. So I'm going to ask everybody to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail and explain exactly who you are and what you're up to. Why don't you start with you? Hi everyone, my name is Christina Dimitrova and I run Interlaced, which is a media and events platform that focuses on fashion innovation and innovation in retail, beauty and the next wave of the industry. Wonderful, thanks. Scott? I'm Scott Cohen, I'm the co-founder of the Cyborg Nest, where we create artificial senses. And at the end of 2016, I put a couple of titanium rods in my chest and attached a circuit board with a couple hundred components so that I have the sense of the magnetic field of the planet. Awesome. Alessandra. Hello everyone, my name is Alessandra Minogasa. I work at Happy Finish doing VR and AR programming. My background is in 3D design, but now with the whole um, wave of this new technology, we're diving in with, you know, essentially what is MR, which is mixed reality. Mookie. Hey everyone, good to be back. My name is Mookie and I'm an executive digital producer of Mookie International covering all cross-platform digital production, web app, VR, AR, live streaming, social media, specializing primarily in the music and broadcasting worlds. Before that I was an MTV and done BBC and lots and lots of broadcasters and labels and artists and things like that. And the way that I work with technology and new exciting things and futuristic things with what we're all going to be talking about now is how to be implementing that within the broadcasting and music space, primarily in the youth culture sectors, sections, <laughs> youth when I say sections, sections the sector youth. <laughs> and I have no microchips or, or circuit boards in my brain, but I would like to, <laughs> I think one day. Thank you. And Amalia. Hi, I'm Amelia Coleman. I am a futurist based here in London. So I write and talk on the latest new technologies and their impact on business and the future of our lives. And I tend to hook up startups with corporate clients. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us. We're live today from the PwC Future Lab. And whilst you're sitting here in this wonderful new techie space, I thought it would be interesting to perhaps follow up a little bit deeper on Muki's point there about wanting to integrate technology into the human body. <laughs> now, <laughs> I see that now, <laughs> but check back with me in like 2025. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who talk about this and who, you know, there's a lot of talk, there's a lot of conceptualization around the idea of integrating technology into the body, mm -hmm. but there's very few people who actually take that next step, as lovely Scott has done. And so I'm kind of <laughs> curious as to, first of all, what would be the productive, useful nature of the technology that one would want to integrate into the body and why? And I, I say this because, as a for example, with wearable technology, I have seen a whole varied array of different wearable technologies that people have given to me over the years and told me to try this or try that. And all of them have ended up in a cupboard, the back of a cupboard, within about six weeks, what? to be fair. Just, <laughs> how do you know how many, how many steps you've taken? You've been in a lot of closets. Maybe I don't have one of these Fitbits on. I had you a just Fitbit. walk around the city and just guess? I had a Fitbit and it honestly... Yeah, you know those kind of things when you measure the size of a room and it goes... Yeah. <laughs> no, maybe she's like Rain Man and she's just like, at the end of the day, 12,312. <laughs> for me, that data isn't, isn't valuable. It's not important to my life. And so I wasn't feeling like I was getting used out of the technology. So it ends up in the back of my cupboard because I'm just like, you know what? Nice to have, but really doesn't add anything to my life. Whereas when I got the curve ring, which is basically an NFC contactless payment ring, that is the one piece of technology that I, well, a year and a half on now I am still using the ring. I'm using it for all my payments. I don't even understand the concept of cash, and I haven't had cash <laughs> in my pocket for about six years. But the idea that I can't pay with a contactless ring for me now is really weird. I only but... use checks. <laughs> <laughs> Travel checks. <laughs> but it's that idea of what is the, the use case that makes that technology important in your life. For me, it's the idea that I don't have to have an Oyster card or you know, whip out my phone or, or whatever the thing is in order to be able to travel around London, I can just literally fist bump whatever the payment pad is and that's that's fine by me. But what is that use case that would, would convince you that actually this technology is important, it's important enough that I should be thinking about integrating this technology into my physical person? 
And I'm curious, you know, from your perspective, what I'm that happy would be. to take that off because you listed every reason to have <laughs> convenience in your life. And it is that integration of having things instantly and mm. conveniently. And you know that everything is in the power of your ring at the moment. You know, <laughs> right, so when I get mugged for my ring, I'm not going to I was going to ask about it. I'm too afraid that someone's going to either steal it or just, or you're just accidentally you're going to like pay for someone's bill or just like flicking. But I'm less worried about like paying, that. accidentally paying for somebody else because you've got to be pretty obvious about the payment. But the great thing about it is, at the moment, it's such early technology that most people have no idea that that's it's a payment. That it does but that, that's yeah. where you could yeah. then implement your, again, data, yeah. your details, your bank things, and, yeah. and take the information in that ring and yeah. put it, embed it in your hands. That's what I'm saying to or you. Or your wrist. That would be a convincing what use case for me. What is the reason? It's convenient yeah. but, and it's But I don't think it has to be. For you, but yeah. Yeah, but see, for everybody think, it's different. I, I think it's the other way. It's the opposite of it needs to be functional or practical. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I think people are, are are more attracted by emotional attachments to things. I mean, mm. you can watch a film in black and white. You don't need to see it in color, mm. but it's just nicer. Mm. It's Unless a it's richer like experience. A or right? It's a richer experience. Mm. To, and so I think it's it's things around the emotional connection to stuff. Yeah, you don't need your iPhone to do certain things like when you pinch something with your fingers. But once we had it that way, we always wanted it that way. It, mm -hmm. you, you, you become attached to the technology in an emotional bond, not a functional bond. Otherwise, we'd still be using Blackberries because functionally, <laughs> they were great for email. Yeah, they were. <laughs> and really, really not irritating at all when someone didn't cut their nails. <laughs> <laughs> But then how does that work then with Tanya's convenience and practicality but and the embedding question? I, I want to go back to this this emotional connection thing, though, for just for one second, because A, I think it was really interesting that as Scott was saying this, on this huge big screen behind Scott, there is this constant, looping, <laughs> there's this constant so. looping video. But well, as he you. said, emotional connection, that picture of an old hand and a little baby's hand connecting Aww. was behind him as he said it. And it's like... We all were going to cry. But, but think cry. about everything we, we, we purchase. Yes. We purchase because of emotional connections. I mean, think about something as, as simple as a Coca-Cola. Mm. And how many times have you seen an advertisement for Coca-Cola in your lifetime? I mean, I'm the oldest one here, so I'm 52. So millions and millions of... I know. You look shocked. <laughs> <laughs> you it's you can't see me, but, but I only really look 51. <laughs> <laughs> no, but millions of ad impressions for Coca-Cola mm. through my life from billboards and TV commercials and branding all over the place. And never once in any of their advertising did they say, High fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. caramel coloring, <laughs> citric pain. acid, carbonated water. <laughs> They never sell the ingredients. They sold the emotion of enjoyment. Happiness. Coke Happiness. ads make me angry. <laughs> but but, but no, nevertheless. Yeah. I hate Coke ads. But his, what I'm saying is that yeah. the most successful products in the world didn't sell because of their functionality. They mm -hmm. didn't list ingredients. They had an emotional connection with the people mm -hmm. that... You didn't buy those shoes because they were the most functional shoes on the but planet. Every, you bought them because they were stylish. Not every and, purchase is, a fun, is emotional, like paying your bills. But Surprisingly, they are. And, and but I think there is a degree of are. emotional connection to the payment. Because it makes you relieved. Because People that keep their, the, the same phone company because that's the one that they've they have always comfort. had. They have that comfort and security of, of knowing the company or, or whatever the relationship Loyalty. is. Loyalty. And, you know, it's interesting, though, because one of the things, and I, I know that I say this and certain people who shall remain nameless will hate that I'm using this phrase again, but I'm going to use it, which is that this, this kind of digital generation that we have has a learned helplessness on technology. And that idea of learned helplessness, I know that some people don't like using that phrase, but I do think it's true. I think it's, it's very relevant, especially when we talk about things like the mobile phone, when, you know, when I'm doing a, a large talk sometimes, and I, I will just do the little mini exercise where we say to people, you know, okay, take out your phone, right, unlock it, hand it to a stranger and let them have a rummage. Do you feel any kind of emotion? And most people will immediately say, I feel panicked, I feel stressed, <laughs> I feel, you know, violated, or whatever the thing is. It's like, why do you feel an emotion when all you've done is hand over a block of technology? Why do you apply an emotional sentiment to that block of technology? Because it's not the technology that you actually have the emotion to. It's the apps or the applications 
on the technology that you have the emotional connection to. For the data. Yeah. Think of the, the data. data. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's what's an invasion of your privacy. But why, yeah. would, why would you care about that invasion of privacy when there are other things that you do where you give away equally as That's much data? Yeah. But the format of delivery. Because we're humans and we're emotional mm. beings and we like to think of ourselves as logical beings mm. and we're so not. Yeah. We're, and, 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 this is from a guy that's not very emotional. It <laughs> you know, doesn't even get a card for Valentine's time to my wife. Right. But, I'll but, tweet. but but yet I I, I think we're we're creatures of emotions. Mm. Well, and I think one of the big draws to getting implanted is this <coughs> hope for the future, this curiosity that that there can be more experiences, that the human experience can be enhanced in new ways that we haven't experienced before, that we can relate to our world and relate to other people. And I think hope is a big emotion behind that, this kind of investment in the future that it can be better. Mm -hmm. I also think there is, as well. Mm -hmm. But there is difference between having something, you know, doing all the wearable stuff that you mentioned and something carrying, you know, from carrying our phones to putting stuff on our wrists and, and fingers and whatnot and then embedding something in your body. I think that's, that is a next level that a mm -hmm. lot of people are not ready for. And it's the question, though, of why there is that barrier, still that mental and emotional barrier of not being ready, as you say. Because it's true that most people, when you take that next step of, okay, I'll put a ring on my finger versus I'll put a chip in my hand, there's a distinct difference in the way that people emotionally connect to that action. Fear of the unknown, too. Yeah. Who, wants, who wants to be cut open? Circuit board man is staring at me weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I think like an average person just is really happy not to have to be cut open but then and have something. You say, average, and it's you what say this. Average, average tattoos. Average. You, yeah, that's not, which not, it, it is average. Okay. If you're under I, 35, it yeah. is average. And I and stick a contact in my eye every day. Yeah. I'm and you have your ears okay. pierced. Um, so the thing sure, is, sure, I agree with all that. <laughs> the point is, <laughs> the question was... And you have your ears pierced. Oh my God, that's so <laughs> you got them. <laughs> 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 Guilty as charged. <laughs> but the question was about, you know, where does the, you mm. know, where do, when does it become mainstream and getting the, but you I think know, does, does it go from... Having something physical, a device to or what something you wear to something you're. I, I think it'll be a progression though, in the same way I that agree. with mobile yeah. phones. You know, you started out with the literally the big walkie-talkie clip to the belt, and yeah. you know we've got to the stage now where you know at first people would look at you if you had one of those like. Just bouncing you know, off I never yeah. Like, never I never yeah, you know they, they, they always looked at you like, why do you need this huge chunk of What's you know, wrong phone? With you? What's wrong with? You? But now we're at the stage. It's like if you don't have a mobile phone, somebody would be like, why do you not have a mobile phone? How can you live without a mobile phone or a smartphone? That that is it's taken maybe a decade for us to get to that stage where the technology is so yeah. crucial and integral to every life. But it has been a journey, and I wonder if perhaps it's just a case of time. Before of we get to that, yeah. there were people in the early days. I mean, you, again, be, being the oldest one here, you know, <laughs> the people. But you did, don't look at we're, 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 right. Yeah, we're, I don't. Fifty-one, I look. <laughs> they, they can't see that I'm bald. <laughs> Are no. you Google? <laughs> you know, people didn't know that they needed email. Mm. You know, back in the mid '90s, it was Foxing. like, what yeah. did people need an email for? Mm. And then, what did I need a mobile phone for? And mm -hmm. you know, it. 20 years might sound Imagine. like a long time, but it isn't. And all of a sudden, people could say, how could I not have these things? How could I not have instant access to messaging people and to information and data and connection with people? But I mean, people like growing up in the Midwest, you know, you, you get these type of big chunky, they would look like a big suitcase, like a big attache mm -hmm. case. And that would be like the phone and still have like a cord attached to it. Yeah. Curly to yeah. cord. Yeah. I never had one. Like my older cousins had them. And it would be like for an emergency in case they break down the side of the road. There's lots of snow in the, mm -hmm. the Midwest. This is not cold here in London, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you all know. It's trying something for a safety reason. Mm -hmm. Again, you're going to go back to emotions for that. But like her mom, my aunt got it for her. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, well, you're going to be moving to the city. It's important you have this. And then you keep it as part of like your emergency kit. But it's often down. that the non-functional things are what make the number it. number for convenience. Yeah, but then yeah. it's the then things it that you don't yeah. think about mm. that, you know, what do you do on your phone all day if you pay Candy Crush and update your Instagram account? <laughs> these are not essentials to life, yeah. except but they, they are. are. <laughs> How many 11-year-olds do you know? Right. <laughs> work with. 
you know, it is. Yeah. It I work is. with none. Yeah, <laughs> I work with a lot, and I can tell you right now, if they would, they die without their Instagram account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were going on holiday with their family, like a half term thing, mm-hmm. and they were going up to the Lake District, and the girl cried for like a week because she was Aww. afraid that she'd lose followers on her Instagram. Oh my God, that's yeah. my neighbor. Oh. Sorry, let it's me go. Not on your Instagram, it doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was even a couple of years ago. Yeah. But you know? here's, here's the thing. So upset. So upset. Here's the thing that I'm interested to understand, which is we're talking about this idea of being able to accept the idea of integration of technology into the human body. And whilst Scott is definitely on the front edge of that particular <laughs> curve, what I'm curious to understand is what is that significant change that needs to happen? be it a cultural change or a technological change, that is going to just shift the needle in terms of how mainstream consumers view this idea of the integration of technology into the human body. So mm. I'm going to ask you first, Amelia, because you've had more chance to think about this <laughs> than anybody else. Yeah, sure. What's your thoughts? Well, actually, I'm going to take a bit of a different angle on it. When we talk about the new realities, virtual reality, mixed reality, and... I see that within the next five to 10 years, there's going to be a whole nother dimension that we have the ability to interact with um, that are layers of layers of data all around us that give us access to communicate across geographic locations and all these kind of new abilities for that convenience of interaction. I think we are going to want to be able to tap into that instantly. Like we want things to happen um, as fast as possible instantly. And so I can see that being, you know, a tap on the side of my head and then my that that other dimension comes up or you know I'll be able to point at something and I'll turn it on and off so being a human conductor for enabling this technology because it happens instantly and it gives me access to new dimensions and a whole new world would probably do it for me whoa okay mm-hmm. I think well Culturally, I just think the narrative might need to change slightly Mm. because we're especially here in the U.S., we're constantly surrounded with this narrative that robots are going to come and take our jobs or kill us and, you know, or both. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, (laughs) you know, we have stuff like Black Mirror. If you've seen like the latest season, you know, like what when they do the episode where they implant something in a little girl's um, head or something. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens after that. Like that is crazy so for order you know people to to be more open to that Mm -hmm. the narrative needs to change and yes of course you need to be skeptic and you need to make sure that you know everything that might happen to you or might not happen to you if you do that to Mm -hmm. your body I also think we we shouldn't just do the extremes it's not like oh my god like we're gonna die and then oh my god it's gonna be like you know utopia Mm -hmm. you know the world that we imagine or want to create for ourselves and then yeah I just feel like in terms of in interaction how we're going to progress in the future my hope would be that you know in a sense we will be technology so we will be technology everything will be kind of moving as technology we will be technology our body will be you know interacting with the environment around us mm-hmm. with the surfaces objects you know things like that and that might be a little bit you know far-fetched future but that we just be the batteries for the matrix <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And Scott, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I, I think that for a younger generation, particularly the under 20s today, there'll be an expectation that I can't believe I can't already do this, mm-hmm. yeah. that I, they will be feel that what we think is, all right, we've had enough. We've reached the pinnacle. We have iPhones and some some <laughs> crappy AR goggles. <laughs> and there's a younger generation going, like, that is so not what I expect think of the future. Like 2000 and late. I don't yeah. want to be like you, Dad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even, even us young folks around this, now we will feel very old to mm. them. That yeah. This won't seem extreme by, the, the, they'll, they'll be surprised that the products and services don't exist already. Like, I can't believe I can't put a chip in my hand or an implant in my brain. I think we're already there. And the only thing that gets us over the hurdle is people to actually make it. I actually think the people are ready. Yeah, okay. no, I agree 100% with you, especially I think because I belong to the 20s generation when ever I've been showing my AR works or VR works to my nephews and nieces that are actually younger, they want more. They have, you know, a dancing Winnie the Pooh on your table. It's like, oh, but why can't I swipe it different colors? Mm-hmm. And you're there like, oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I go back to my computer and yeah. I'm like, okay, 
And then it's like, but why can't it sing in a different language? So they definitely expect it. So I really think it's the next natural step mm -hmm. because if you think about it, we're holding our phones all the time, we're looking at screens all the time. So I think it's only natural that the next progression is with our bodies because mm -hmm. it, it, it makes sense. And like Scott says, the that technology is there. And I think it's that, you know, we still have scared of what can go wrong, what can, you know, change. And I think once we get past that with, you know, new generations and new technology that hopefully people will start to implement and start to, you know, become more familiar with, mm -hmm. then I think we'll, we'll get there. Okay. So I'm going to roll off that thought because I yeah. love it. <laughs> I love it. And where it's seen happening now in 20, 2018 is the, you know, the voice recognition that is implementing things you do with your phone, with your lights, with everything else, just by your voice. And that is the pinnacle mm -hmm. tipping point where we're coming to of not having to rely on something physical. And screens. I have to say that this is totally true in terms of, in, certainly in my house with Alexa, I've got to the stage where I am so Can lazy. You're ready to fight with her? <laughs> I don't really have any arguments. <laughs> like, I, 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 I said cello music. <laughs> but I, but I, seriously, I, I'm so lazy that I can't even be bothered to check a clock anymore. I'm just like, Alexa, what time is it? You know, it's like the assumption that I will just say something out loud and I will be told the information that I want. Like, yeah. what's the weather right now? And how do I get from A to B and all this kind of... I don't need to look it up anymore. I don't need yeah. to start tapping on a computer or, you know, whip out my phone or any of these other things. I've become pretty lazy in my own house, yeah, I have to say. I'm just keeping it <laughs> tiny short. It's just it tie, it's tying in every day with the music industry. I'm sure, mm. Scott, you see this too, the cover of Music Week and things like that. Yeah. You know, the implementation of, besides the Amazon Music and your Spotify's and everything else, is like now labels and bands and artists and a lot of... The, some of my clients even, like, how do I get Alexa skills? How can I make sure that my album will be heard if someone yells out, blah, 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 yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm. Like, fresh release your music. <laughs> <laughs> get your PRS and your, yeah. your, your licensing and publishing search, it'll be fine. Uh, but that's a really great point of, that's, you know, a product, mm. it's a physical product, that's a brand, whether you're an artist or a clothing brand or anything, is concerned about reaching the consumer. Like, mm. how can they implement it? Mm. So it's a tool. So, as always, we like to give our audience a way to find out a little bit more about you. And we ask you to do that by sharing with us your social media handle of choice. What would that be? Okay, so Interlaced is at We Are Interlaced on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So just find us there. And the website is interlaced.co. Thank you. So for me, Scott Cohen, if you try and find it, there's so many Scott Cohens and an actor <laughs> named Scott Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> So, so how, how do, do, how do, you, how do yeah, we find you, the right so you? So try things like Scott Cohen Cyborg. <laughs> or, or the Cyborg Nest. Uh, you can find it on all social media. If you type in Cyborg Nest. Cyborg Nest it is. Nice. Uh, so on my part, we are Happy Finish. I know, heard all the jokes. <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty much the same. Happy Finish on Twitter, Instagram, our website, happyfinish.com. And uh, yeah, check us out. And your personal Twitter? Oh, I don't really have Twitter. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she's, yeah. Too, she's too cool for that. Well, <laughs> no, I, I think it's because I work so much in tech that I kind of try to remove myself. It's, it's weird, like Facebook as well. I'll save really that for the next podcast because <laughs> it's going to be really interesting, I think. Uh, <laughs> you can find me at Mookie Approved, M U K I Approved. Thank you. And I'm at Amelia Kalman. That's A M E L I A K A L L M A N. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for listening. If you enjoy this content, don't forget to subscribe and review and follow us on Twitter at Digital Jam LTD. Thinking of starting your own podcast? Why not speak to the GL Pro UK team? They handle all of our podcasting service needs. Tell them that Digital Jam Session sent you and you'll get 10% off your first order. Find out more at www.glpro.co.uk. DigitalJamSessions.com